It is great to be gathered with the people of God. Amen? Now, what a passage of Scripture that the Lord has brought us to this morning as we continue to follow King David. Are you ready to hear the word of the Lord? Amen. God's word for today, 2 Samuel chapter 6. The word of God says, beginning in verse 1, that David again gathered all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000. And David arose and went with all the people who were with him from Baal of Judah to bring up from there the ark of God, which is called by the name of the Lord of hosts who sits enthroned on the cherubim. And they carried the ark of God on a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was on a hill. And Uzzah and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, were driving the new cart, and with the ark of God, and Ahio went before the ark. And David and all the house of Israel, they were celebrating before the Lord with songs and lyres and harps and tambourines and castanets and cymbals. And when they came to the threshing floor of Nacon, Uzzah, he put out his hand to the ark of God, and he took hold of it, for the oxen stumbled. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and God struck him down there because of his error, and he died there beside the ark of God. And David was angry because the Lord had broken out against Uzzah. And that place is called Perez Uzzah to this day, which means the breach of Uzzah. And David was afraid of the Lord that day, and he said, how can the ark of the Lord come to me? So David was not willing to take the ark of the Lord into the city of David, but David took it aside to the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite. And the ark of the Lord, it remained in the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite for three months, and the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all his household. And it was told King David, the Lord has blessed the household of Obed-Edom and all that belongs to him because of the ark of God. So David went, and he brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with rejoicing. And when those who bore the ark of the Lord had gone six steps, he made sacrifice with an ox and a fattened animal. And David danced before the Lord with all his might. And David was wearing a linen ephod. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the horn. Now the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of the Lord will stand forever. This is the word of the Lord. And you can have a seat. What we see in the text this morning, as David attempts to bring the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem, is David's desire for the Lord's presence. David was a man after God's own heart, a man in alignment with God, a man who wanted more than anything else nearness to God, God's presence. Anybody else here this morning here because you long for the Lord's presence? Tell your neighbor, I want God's presence. Amen. I want the presence of God. That sounds good, right? But do you know what the presence of our holy God entails? Have you seen in the scriptures what happens when people come into contact with the presence of a holy God. We have a holy, holy, holy God. And if we desire the presence of God, it is of utmost critical, indispensable importance that we desire the presence of the one and only true God, the real God, the one holy God, and not the presence of a God of our own imagination. That should give us pause, should give us some things to think about as we seek the presence of our infinitely holy God, and we see in the text this morning God's seriously deadly holiness and the corresponding response of the people who have experienced the presence of God and respond in seriously holy exuberance. This morning, we're talking about the exchange, the interaction, even the interplay of deadly holiness, and holy exuberance. Now, there is a tremendous amount to be understood here in this story, here in the text, about the Lord's presence. 
Now, this is an incredible, wild story of ups and downs we see here in this chapter in the life of David. He sets out to go and to retrieve the ark. This most sacred vessel, the representative throne of God, the resting place of the Shekinah glory, the very mercy seat of the immediate presence of the manifest glory of God, where under the old covenant, God would meet on earth with man, where man could draw near to God, to God's presence. But if you know your Bible, and you know your Old Testament, then you know that during the time of Moses, while the Hebrews were in the wilderness, God gave instructions for the building and transporting of the ark. And he instructed them as they traveled to set up camp, and they worshiped around the tabernacle, the tent of meeting, where inside the tabernacle, in the midst of the sacred lamps and the smoke and the incense, behind the veil in the holy of holies, at the center of it all, at the heart of it all, was the ark of the covenant where the Lord would meet with Moses behind the veil and speak to him from between the cherubim. But during the time of the judges, before Saul began to reign, the ark had been lost. It had been taken captive by the Philistines in battle. And then through a miraculous series of events, the ark, it caused the Philistines so much hardship, it was a curse to them, and the Philistines, they returned it. They said, get it away from us, and they gave it back to the Israelites. They said, that thing is nothing but trouble, and we don't want it. But for some reason, worship was so out of whack in Israel during the time of the judges and in the time of Saul that even when the Philistines returned the ark to Israel, the Israelites, they never returned it to the tabernacle. Now understand, in the time after the ark went missing, we're told the glory of the Lord had departed Israel. But the religious rituals didn't stop. The worship services kept going. Even though the glory of the Lord had departed, we're told, and the ark wasn't in the tabernacle behind the veil, the priests, they still went right on sacrificing and worshiping and carrying on their routine. And the people, they kept right on going, going through their religious ritual. They went right on with their worship services. They just did it without the glory of God doing the same thing they'd done before, acting as if the Lord were there when the presence of the Lord was not there. They gathered, they offered sacrifices, they worshiped before an empty tent. The glory of the Lord had departed Israel, the scripture says. They had lost the glory of God. They had ritual without relationship and praise without presence. And David, it's a man after God's own heart, He's a man who longs for nothing more than he longs for God's presence. Do you long for God's presence? Tell your neighbor, I want God's presence. David wants God's presence. So David says to the people of God in 1 Chronicles 13, let us go and bring back the ark of our God as we did not inquire of him in the days of Saul. David is determined to bring the Ark of the Covenant into the city to dwell there in the midst of the people to usher in the presence of God. When we arrive in the text this morning, David has just become king. In chapter 5, David, he pulls together all the tribes of Israel, Judah in the south, all the tribes in the north, and they uniformly, they make a covenant with David at Hebron, and they anoint him as their king. And then, with David as their leader, for the first time ever, the armies of Israel, they go and they conquer and they take possession of the city of Jerusalem. For the first time, the people of God, they take possession of the city that is to be God's holy city, the city of Jerusalem where God will instruct the building of his holy temple, where the ark will have a permanent home, and God will make his dwelling place among men. David then takes residence there, building his governmental headquarters there in what is called the city of David. And having united the tribes, having conquered Jerusalem, having established his governance in his first initiative, his first priority, his first undertaking, his first official act as king, David determines to usher in the presence of God. To be God's king, Establish God's holy city and return the Ark of the Covenant to a place where the nations will gather to worship. And to perform this monumental undertaking, David orchestrates this epic 
event. Verse 1, David, he gathers all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000 men, 30,000. And they head to Gibeah, where after some prior searching, David, he'd located the ark, tucked away in safekeeping in the private home of a man named Abinadab. Okay? Listen to what I just said. David finds the Ark of the Covenant being stored in some random guy's house in a city on a hill. And it had just been sitting there in the family's house in storage for decades. Okay, that's the kind of lack of care that these people had for the presence of God. And it was the sons of Abinadab, the man who had been keeping the ark, who were transporting the ark. They were tasked with transporting the ark, and they had placed the ark on an ox cart. Verse 3 tells us twice it wasn't just any ox cart. It was a new ox cart, a brand new cart. And so off they go, down the hill on their ark cart rampage. And verse 5, David, he strikes up the band. And all the house of Israel, all the people, they were celebrating before the Lord with songs and lyres and harps and tambourines and castanets and cymbals. I didn't bring any instruments this morning, so there will not be a demonstration. (laughs) But if you can imagine the sound of blaring horns and shaking tambourines and clashing cymbals, and you understand, they were making a joyful noise, all right? They were banging out a holy clanging. And here they go bringing the ark. Now they don't know how to bring the ark. Nobody's moved the ark in decades. Put it on a cart. It makes good sense, right? So here they came down the hill. The oxen, they start to pull the cart. Abinadab's sons, Uzzah, Uzzah, and Ahio, they're driving the new cart. The Kohathites, they're walking alongside the cart. Here we go. We're doing it. We're going. Horns blaring. Uh, uh, right? It's going great. And it's not the way that God had instructed it to be done in the past. It's not being done according to the word of God, according to the meticulous detail of the word of the law of God that he had given for the building of these sacred objects and the transporting of these sacred objects according to the commands that he had given to his people in the past. But the intent is good. The motive is good. We're seeking out the presence of God. We're rolling along. It's not God's way, but it's working great. And for a time... Seeking God's presence your way and doing things your way, it seems like it's working great. Now for David, this was working great. And then the oxen stumbled. Then there was a stumbling. They stumbled. And the cart began to rock. And now in a mere moment, things got sideways, right? Just the slightest bit off kilter. The ark began to shift. And Uzzah, well-meaning as he was, he was startled thinking the most holy vessel, the Ark of the Covenant with God, was ready to fall to the ground into the dirt to be broken and defiled and to lay profaned. Uzzah, by instinct, he stepped in, shot out his hand. He took hold and steadied the Ark. And at this point, as R.C. Sproul jokes, what happened then? Well, the heavens opened and a voice came down saying, Thank you, Uzzah! No. As soon as Uzzah touched the holy ark of God, God struck him dead. Because there are specific instructions for the way in which we relate to God. And the way we understand his holiness. And in the scripture we see our God is terrifyingly, deadly, holy. He is not one to be trifled with. And in Exodus chapter 25, God had given specific instructions about how the ark had to be transported. It says, you shall cast four rings of gold for it and put them on its four feet, two rings on the one side of it and two rings on the other side of it. You shall make poles of akasha wood and overlay them with gold and you shall put the poles into the rings on the sides of the ark to carry the ark by them. This is how the ark is to be carried. And the Kohathites, the specially trained men of the tribe of Levi, they were to carry the ark with the poles on their shoulders. Not on a new cart, and not by well-meaning Uzzah, because God had given specific instructions in his word and called them to specific 
Christian. As one pastor explains, the one absolute non-negotiable principle that every Kohathite had drummed into his head from the time that he was a child was this. Never, 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 ever touch the throne of God. And God said, if you touch it, you die. There were very, very specific instructions that God gives in his word for the handling of the ark. It's to be carried with poles on foot. Should have never been in a cart. But for ignorance, expedience, being well-meaning, Uzzah was driving the ark in a fancy new cart. Even while they were perfectly well-meaning, while their motives may have been absolutely pure, they hit a bump in the road. And their failure to honor the word of God, it in a moment turned deadly. In a word, Uzzah broke the law of God, and it killed him. But his mistake, as Sproul points out, was trying to preserve the throne of God from being desecrated by the mud, but he presumed that his hands were less polluted than the dirt. But the dirt had always done exactly as it was supposed to do, following the laws of God day in and day out, every day doing exactly what dirt is supposed to do. But it was the hand of man that God said cannot lay upon his throne. And Uzzah, he wasn't going to be able to reach out and save the ark of God. We do not save or protect or rescue our God. Uzzah needed God to save him. And that day all Israel was reminded that our God is to be respected and revered And he is deadly holy. We want the presence of God. But God has given commands in his word and instructed that he is to be approached in a very specific way. Well-meaning is not well enough if we are not word of God honoring. And disobedience is a dangerous thing. Do you still want the presence of God? Well, for David and Israel, that was enough for this day. David was angry and afraid and confused. Now, the ark cart parade, it was canceled. They took the ark to the house of Obed-Edom and they left it there. And David said, how can the ark of the Lord come to me? The man after God's own heart, how can the ark of the Lord come to me? But David, being a man after God's own heart, he goes back and he seeks to hear the word of the Lord. He came to understand the writings of God which preceded this. They were numerous, and there in the Scripture, they are there on account of God's kindness. As one pastor explains, the prospects of terrible, dreadful judgments are not in the Bible in order to frighten us away from him, but in order that we might approach him on our knees as creatures before a creator, as subjects before a king. And recognize as we do that his ways are not our ways and his thoughts are not our thoughts. These warnings are clearly there so that people can draw near to him. To experience life and joy and blessing in him. And to not die. As the book of Hebrews says, it is appointed for man to die once and then to face judgment. And if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment. The death is coming, and so is judgment, and the warnings are there. Are you prepared to stand in the presence of a holy God? God desires our presence, and in his presence are pleasures forever. But he has told us we have to approach him on his terms, to understand the deadly seriousness of his holiness, to take his warnings seriously, to understand that the presence of God is matchless, fearful, awesome, and it demands reverence. Do you believe this? And in the midst of the separation that exists between fallen sinners and God's holiness, God makes a way. He makes a way that we can draw near and that we can experience his awesome presence. And David was determined to do what God had called him to do. 
David knew his purpose, and David was determined to usher in God's presence. Knowing God's deadly holiness, having experienced it firsthand, David wants the presence of God. As he would sit in the presence of God in the next chapter, and he would pray, he said, Who am I, O Lord God, and what is my house that you have brought me thus far? You are great, O Lord God, for there is none like you, and there is no God beside you. But David knew that God was great, that there was none like him. Knowing God's deadly holiness, David knew also his love and his goodness and his greatness. And David longed for the presence of God. And after three months, verse 12, David learns that the Lord was blessing the home of Obed-Edom because of the ark of God. And so David determines to go again and to bring the ark to Jerusalem, this time in God's way. First Chronicles chapter 15 tells us David gathered the Levites. He inquired of the Lord about how to do it in the prescribed way, and the priests and the Levites, they consecrated themselves in order to bring up the ark of the Lord, the God of Israel. And the Levites, they carried the ark of God with the poles on their shoulders as Moses had commanded in accordance with the word of the Lord. And David brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with rejoicing. In 1 Chronicles 15, David commanded the chiefs of the Levites to appoint their brothers as the singers who would play loudly on musical instruments, on harps and lyres and cymbals and trumpets to raise sounds of joy. And all Israel brought up the ark of the covenant of the Lord with shouting to the sound of the horn, trumpets, cymbals, and loud music on harps and lyres. And verse 14, David danced. He danced before the Lord with all his might while wearing a linen ephod. So David and all the house of Israel, verse 15, they brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the horn. The first attempt to bring in the ark of the covenant, it ends with God striking a man dead. Uzzah dies for not honoring God's instructions. And we see that playing, we see that playing fast and loose with the commands and instructions of a holy God. It's a deadly, dangerous game. But doing things God's way, honoring his word, approaching him with reverence and experiencing his presence brings joy. Where before the presence of God was the occasion of great dread. Now the presence of God is the occasion for great joy, for celebrating, rejoicing, leaping, shouting, dancing. David and all the, the house of Israel, they brought up the ark of the Lord with music and dancing and shouting. They shouted for joy in the presence of God. Do you really want the presence of God? Have you experienced the presence of God? Does your worship of God include reverence for his holiness? Does your holy worship of God have room for rejoicing? To honor God, to celebrate God in a pure and joyful way as David's son Solomon in the wisdom of God he later tells us, there is a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance and a time to keep silent and a time to shout. Psalm 32, David says, Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O you righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. Psalm 47, Clap your hands, all peoples. Shout to God with loud songs of joy, for the Lord the Most High is to be feared, a great king over all the earth. Do you want the presence of God? Do you rejoice in his presence? This morning... We are blessed to live on this side of the cross where God no longer manifests his presence on an ark resting between the cherubim to be placed in a temple made of stone. But he came to us in Jesus. Not a vessel of God, but God of very God, God himself in the flesh. 
the glory of God here, near, tabernacled, in flesh, among us, here and present, to lay down his life. He who knew no sin became sin on our behalf to give us the righteousness of God that in him and in faith in him we can now boldly approach him and walk into his presence with confidence. Because if you recall, Jesus, he made a very similar entry into Jerusalem. Not as a vessel of God carrying the old covenant, but God himself in the flesh, God with us, veiled in flesh, the man Jesus, he entered Jerusalem, the very embodiment of the new. God with us, arriving to shouts of Hosanna. And he did not have to make a sacrifice along the road as David did in our text. Because he was the sacrifice. Come to die on the cross, that our sin could be covered, that we could draw near to our perfectly holy God, and for all who believe, he could send us the Holy Spirit of God to dwell in our hearts to be present within us. Do you want the presence of God? Have you experienced his presence? The experience of Christ where people will tear the roof off to bring the spiritually crippled and dying into his presence where dry bones come alive in the presence of he who is infinitely holy. Him who puts our sin to death and leaves our death defeated and leads us in triumphant procession where he says, should we be told to keep silent, even lifeless stones would still cry out. Oh, I won't let the stones cry out for me. I won't let the stones cry out in my place. I want to invite you this morning don't let the rocks cry out for you. Don't let the rocks cry out in your place. But return the very breath that God gave with your praise. Lift him up. Lift him high within your heart. Our holy God with everything that's in you, with the unabashed joy that David knew as he leapt and danced and shouted before the Lord. Bless his holy name. If you've never given your praise to God, given your life to Christ, if you've never done that before, I want to invite you to do that. Do that this morning. Come forward in just a minute. Meet with me up here. Let's pray together so that you can know the joy of God that David knew and you can know that joy in his presence forever. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord God, as David says in the next passage after this one, where he is accused of being debased before the people for his dancing before God. Father, I pray that you would give us hearts to boast in our weakness, to be willing to be humble to be debased, to shout out your glory. Father, you say that you've chosen us. You say that we're yours. You say that you're worthy and owed all the worship that we could give. Father, would you give us hearts moved to give it? Then would we leave the judgment to you? by the aid of your Holy Spirit and in the matchless authority of your Son, Jesus Christ, to you, Father, we pray. Amen.